thank you everybody for uh, uh, being with us as we push through uh, the program. Um, this is a great session uh, that we have lined up. It comes in he on heels of the, um, the very important conversations uh, that we've been having. And I know many of you were with us last night at um, uh, Disney as we celebrated the uh, life and work uh, of Dr. Jack Shaheen. And uh, throughout the day, uh, this topic, this conversation has come up in different uh, uh, panels and we were alluding to the conversation about the portrayals of uh, Arabs in uh, uh, media. Uh, the title of the panel, of course, is uh, uh, the 40, uh, this is, th I'll backtrack a little bit, this is the 40th uh, anniversary of Edward Said's book, Orientalism, uh, and the important work uh, that, that that was has, has impacted everybody on this panel, has impacted the community. Um, and it's, some, and it's a topic that's uh, uh, very timely. Um, and it's something we, we wanted to discuss at the convention. It's been discussed before, but the, t the take we're going to have on it here is looking at 40 years after Orientalism in, in the new age of media and 21st what we're calling 21st century Orientalism. We want to discuss how similar is it to what we've been seeing, what's changed about the portrayals of Arabs over the, since this book has been released and his work. Uh, what's similar? And I'm sure there will be a lot of things that are still uh, uh, similar and, and we're going to hear from uh, experts in the field uh, that have done tremendous work uh, on this issue and on others and have really impacted positively uh, the portrayals of Arabs uh, in the media through their efforts. So uh, I'm just going to do quick introductions and then we'll dive right in. Uh, to my left we have uh, Lorraine Ali who's with the um, LA Times who's done tremendous work through her reporting uh, and a lot of... Uh, <laughs> A lot of folks out here do know her and, and, and are... I didn't pay them to do that, I yeah. see. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the reimbursements <laughs> are for. Um, we have Mr. Uh, uh, Mike uh, Masalam, uh, who's uh, with Mike Masalam Productions and who's also from my hometown of Dearborn, uh, Michigan. Uh, graduated from my high school, uh, Fortson, I think a year or two uh, before me. Class of 96, right? Class of 97, Dearborn 97. High, we'll fight about it what? later. It's all right, we can fight about it later. Shit, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I did not know that. Um, and then, um, he that's, regrets that's disappointing me, me man. This is 17 now. nothing, 14 last night. Um, <laughs> and we have uh, Dr. Mayal Hassan uh, to, uh, at the end, uh, whose um, academics and whose work has really contributed to the ongoing uh, dialogue and conversation and has built on uh, what Dr. Jack Shaheen has done and what Edward Said has done is continuing it into uh, the next generation. Uh, so we're glad for the, the three of you to be with us uh, today. Uh, it's going to be more of a conversation, so I'm just going to uh, open it up with a question, you know, generic overarching question of where are we with the portrayals of Arabs <laughs> in the media and how has it changed in, in, in the past 40 years or so and, and how is it similar with the new age uh, uh, media that we're seeing with social media and everything that's out there so um well yeah. <laughs> that's just that's a small question yeah. i can <laughs> answer that in like three minutes um <laughs> so as somebody who is part of the media the mainstream media um uh, you know i would say uh it's changed a lot in some ways it's it's much better and in other ways it's not but i would say um you know just in a nutshell in my own experience, following 9-11, following the Iraq War, I think um, there was a intensity that was very anti-Arab, anti-Muslim, and people not knowing the difference, you know, they're all one and the same. But then there was a great push the other way for more understanding and for people to educate themselves about like what are what is an Arab? What is the background here? What you know? Uh, get a greater understanding beyond what the media had portrayed Arabs and Muslims like. So I think we're in a really interesting moment right now where you have these really these dueling narratives right now. And if you look at kind of what um, Fox News, what the Trump administration has put out there, what all of this sort of idea of what the Middle East is, what Arabs are, and then you kind of look at social media where that is direct from the Arab world, that is direct from Arab Americans such as ourselves, and um, also you have about, media is so um, fragmented at this point, and that's wonderful, because there's a billion different outlets, and you can get a billion different 
viewpoints on it. So I, I do think it is changing. I think it's up in the air and crazy right now, but I think there's a lot more uh, different narratives out there, and that can be a very good thing. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with that completely. Um, I also think right now what you're seeing is uh, our large conversations around um, what used to be colorblind casting has now become color conscious casting, which I have to point out is different than inclusive casting. Right. So, you know, I th those are those are three sort of uh, concepts that I think the studio systems are definitely talking about. I think inclusion is a big buzzword right now that every major studio and production company is absolutely talking about. You're seeing massive corporations hire heads of inclusion and diversity. Um, but what I also find in as a storyteller and as somebody who is sort of taking in a lot of content and stories being told, what you're also finding now more so than uh, before and hopefully will only increase as time goes on is the intersectionality of identities. So not just stories about Arabs or stories that include Arabs and or Muslims, but Arabs who X or Arabs who are also Y. And, and I think the, the duality or the intersectionality of those um, identifiers is what makes the storytelling A, more authentic, and B, more nuanced, more textured, more exciting. So hi, everybody. Um, I just want to begin, like I begin any time I speak, to acknowledge that we are on occupied Tongva land. As we acknowledge that there is an occupied Palestine, it's important for us to remember what land we stand on here as well. And that's a big part of intersectional work and cooperating with each other as well. So I want to do that and thank all the organizers also for bringing the ADC to the West Coast and to have this conversation because the point of image making cannot be underscored further. It is the place that most Americans get their understanding of us. Um, Institute for Social Policy and Understanding has done a phenomenal report on the fact that most Americans know Muslims, and we can probably include Arabs in this category as well, from TV. Mm -hmm. And uh, for most folks, like my friend Rami Youssef, who's a comedian, says, um, hey, I'm Muslim, he's Muslim Egyptian. Um, you probably know me from such TV shows as Fox News and CNN. <laughs> We're basically on all those shows. Um, he was on Stephen Colbert, you can look up this uh, skit. But we're at a point where he says that, and he also has a show with Hulu that's coming out in 2019. So that's amazing, that's immense. And that work was done because of this moment and because of the work that he has been doing across the board with comedians. Gerard Carmichael, does anybody know who that is? He used to have a show on NBC. Gerard Carmichael is his executive producer. He is a black man from Baltimore, I believe. And the reason why Rami has a show is Gerard put him in front of production companies. They got the production company that made Moonlight. And now they are one of two series that was picked up by Hulu. So this is a big deal for us. Um, so with that small opening, there are a continuation of trends that we've seen for the past century. And that's what's important to know. I just put out a report with this organization called Pop Culture Collaborative, and it's about the representation of Muslims for the last 100 years. And it does build on the work that Jack Shaheen, may he rest in peace, has immensely contributed to the field, but it also asks us to think about our the Muslim community racially, with racial diversity, with gender diversity, um, with a lot more thought than we had been giving it to, towards. As you had mentioned, there is the intersectional element. And you know, when I was speaking with Rami and consulting on his project, he was being pushed to talk about his narrative as a Muslim one. And I said, you know, you are Egyptian from Jersey too, and that's gonna be part of your storytelling. So when the blurb comes out, is that important to you? And he said, yes. So there is a, a there is a desire to put those in conversation, but it's a fight. And so we have to be able to support our creatives in our community so that they understand that we are linked to them as well. But what, what I wanted to bring up with these last 100 years is that 
pre 9 11, it was mostly defined, and maybe later we'll go into this, by what I term as American Orientalism in terms of our portrayals. And there were a lot of political drivers that we've seen in the news when it came to what was going on in Israel Palestine. And we know Jack Shaheen has talked about this immensely, influencing the way that we were being portrayed. But then post 9 11, our portrayal was dominated by the terror genre. And after the election, studio heads, and pre-election, let me go back to that, folks in the community, including Mike, um, had made independent projects that were not necessarily backed by big studios, but after the election of Trump, that's when the big studios came in, and they seemed like they were interested in investing in some of our storytellers. And that was the shift. I mean, somebody like Howard Gordon, who is an executive producer, is the showrunner for um, 24 and for Homeland, was asked point blank by the New York Times if he felt that his shows had contributed to the anti-Arab, anti-Muslim sentiment. And this is after Trump's election. And he said, yes, I unfortunately believe they did. So there are folks who are having a reckoning moment. And though there is a shifting tide, there's still shows like Jack Ryan. <laughs> there's there's Rami uh, from from uh, Mr. Robot, who his executive producer, his showrunner, and him are making another show about an Arab Muslim informant. Sam Ishmael. Yeah, Sam yeah. Ishmael. Um, so an Egyptian. An Egyptian, yeah. exactly. Yeah, Rami Malek's Egyptian too. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and so it's been interesting consulting with Rami on his project because we do want to do it different and do it right. He does want to have a show about surveillance of the mosque and what that means to our community. But there's still all these other elements. Um, and yeah. Just to that point, and what I, what I love about Rami's project is that, we, that he will talk about surveillance of mosques, right? But as an as a American Muslim mosque goer, that is not my experience, right? That's not something I have ever had to think about. And, I, and, we, and Rami and I have talked about the fact that it's not something he has ever had to think about. So doing it from the lens of somebody whose world it's not, but still that it could and does exist, I think is exactly the textured layer that will make it both interesting and authentic. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, and the great thing about, let's just, let's just talk about Rami a little more, <laughs> is that he's Freddie Mercury in the, new, in the upcoming thing about Queen. And oh, Rami Malek. Malek. Rami. Oh, yeah, yeah, Rami yeah, yeah. Malek, yes. Sorry. Yeah, That's yeah, right. yes. So, I was like, what? Did Rami not tell <laughs> no, me? <laughs> Rami, Rami Malek. I'm, go, I'm going yeah, back to Yes, throw, Rami Malek, But yes. anyway, the, the point being is that um, I think it was the last year's Emmys that, you know, everybody was making a big deal about diversity, which they should. It was, you know, that's important. But like kind of what was lost in the conversation was a really big first in that in the in two very high awards were two Muslims. And it was Aziz Ansari and Riz Ahmed for what they had done on HBO. I think what, Master what, of None. Master of None and Night, Night of. Night of. Yeah. yeah, and it was such an amazing moment because the you know, Master of None isn't about being Muslim. It's not about being South Asian. It's, it, it is just about this guy in New York. And he happens to have a Muslim background. He happens, and I think those stories are really important because it's not defined by terrorism. It's not defined by the mosque. It's not defined by, you know, the Middle East. It's just this, he is an American. And it happens to be all these other things that come into the story. And he won awards for that. And to me, that was just like a massive victory because it was like, finally, we're out there and it's not a big breakthrough moment for Muslims. It's just a breakthrough moment for this very nuanced story. It was what you were talking about mm -hmm. as well. It's not the story of all Arabs, the story of all Muslims. It's one guy's story, and he happens to be that. Right, right. Um, from your experiences, I think, Mike, are, are, are there challenges for our community members that want to uh, create this content? I mean, I know alluded earlier that after the election of Trump and so forth, I mean, how significant has the, the change been, and what are the challenges um, they still face. Um, look, I, I, th I'm, I am not a political person, but the number one question I am often asked is, 
but how how have you made it? Isn't that town run by Jews? That's like literally the number one thing people will ask me, right? And the answer is yes, and the answer is who are willing to listen? So I think, you know, and, 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 and the emergence um, that's happened post-Trump has been ha, with organizations that are now cultivating storytellers, um, Arab storytellers, Muslim storytellers, um, uh, that, that are, are here to help. You know, I, 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 I have to also acknowledge that culturally, we are not a community that jumps on board with the arts. No. Yeah. You know, un, you know, it's. I, I've I've never heard uh, um, an Arab parent say, "No, don't go to medical school, become an actor." <laughs> Um, or a journalist, yes, yeah, please. Sure. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, so I, I think that systemic change, I mean, the, the idea necessarily, and not, it doesn't have to be an actor or, or it, but the, the, the systemic change of instilling the art of storytelling or having a voice in which to tell a story, I think has begun, needs to continue and evolve exponentially. I think that will immediately help. But um, I, I personally believe that this is the era of the storyteller. This is the time in which finding one's voice and telling authentic stories that represent um, not just one side of, of, uh, of the coin, but both, and showing a full 360 degree angle of something is always something that the industry will gravitate towards because at its core it will be universal. It will be specific, but everybody will relate to yeah. it. That's great. Right. Did, Tessa, did you want to add or no? Because I have a follow-up to May as well. Sure, you can uh, give me the follow-up. Uh, uh, <laughs> I can talk about anything, unfortunately. Yeah. My dad raised a big mouth. The, um, <laughs> a smart mouth. Well, thank you. Yeah. No, that's not, that's not a smart yeah, mouth. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, thanks. <laughs> it is going to be conversational. Yeah. <laughs> I was oh, like, no, but he would actually agree with you on this. Show. So I'll just have you let, let you guys have a conversation. No. Uh, <laughs> but on the, on the, on the, on the front, because I know we've, we've overlapped a little bit on, on some of the behind-the-scenes stuff, what challenges or differences do you see pre-Trump and post-Trump? Is there like a higher demand now to bring in you know, the expert to say, hey, what's happening here? Yeah, um, I... I I do think there is there's a desire and willingness to engage other narratives, but I think it's still at an optical level. Mm -hmm. And the unfortunate part is there is no real desire for structural change within Hollywood that would that would create different narratives in an organic fashion. Um, Can I just add yeah, to that yeah, yeah. at the studio level? At the right? studio, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, because which makes the independent filmmaker all the more important. Important, exactly. Yeah. And the support for the independent filmmaker and their distribution channels mm -hmm. and pipelines, the more important. So if you have somebody from your community who says, I want to do a web series and they need investment, that's where you and the community need to come in because production companies are picking up successful web series. We saw that happen with a series that was done in Chicago with a brown woman and a black woman and um, a Muslim brown queer woman called Brown Girls, really successful HBO, picked it up. They did it the way they wanted to do it. But had they come to the studio level with that, what do you think would have happened? Nothing. Nothing, exactly. So I think this is where we can really come in. And the when, as we were talking about experts, um, Abed and I sat on a film. I think we signed away our rights to talk about it explicitly. <laughs> um, but this is part of the report. Uh, I have a series of recommendations. And one of them is not to bring us in towards the end. And Lorraine, yeah, you were on that too. Not to bring us in towards the end to be your liaisons to clean up the, the mess you made because you decided that you didn't want to have people from that community be the screenwriters, be the songwriters, be the director. And now we're supposed to do the work to massage your film and its acceptance. So that's the issue that we continue to deal with is incorporating us within the pipeline. And thankfully, people like Mike are working at some of these production companies. Um, how do you call it? it Netflix? Yeah, studio, production, yeah, production company. company. Yeah. Um, so that... Those are the, the cleavages, um, but we can continue to support in so many different ways. So the organization that I work with called Pop Culture Collaborative 
supported this project called Break the Room. And I don't know if you all know how writers' rooms in Hollywood work. I, this was also new to me. The writers are in a room. It's actually very, um, there's an anarchy to it. So people can throw out ideas, but you do have senior and junior writers, you uh, assistant writers in the room. And the problem with that scenario is there's always just usually one person of color in the room, and when they want to talk about an issue that deals with you, you won't get support from the other writers, and you're the one who has all the labor, has to do all the labor to explain the issue to them. It's tokenizing. Tokenizing. Yeah, it's completely tokenizing. And not only that, that person comes in usually because of those diversity fellowships. And then they're looked at as the affirmative action token in the room. So they're not even really believed to the full extent. And then they're stuck. There's an issue of mobility within the room and how to become uh, senior writers and then how to become showrunners. So that's the other point of disruption that we need to make. And this project, you can look in my report called Break the Room that we supported, brought in three at three women of color into the room and they wrote a whole series in a week. And that's unheard of. Hmm. That's a, they wrote a whole web series in a week. Most writers rooms take a whole summer and it's because they didn't have to do the labor of explaining themselves. Uh, to add to that, um, I, I also think the, the, the blind reality is that a writer wants to write what a writer wants to write. So the narrative that they want to put out there it's just going to be what it is, whether it's right or wrong or factual or whatever it is, it's what the writer wants to write. So the goal really is to get the right writers in the room and, and the opportunity for, for uh, you know, people of color, um, various religious um, eth and ethnic uh, affiliations to be able to have the voice to tell the stories that they want to tell. There's a, a very, very popular... Um, medical drama on TV, and they uh, feature a, a woman in hijab, and that the storylines that are breaking for that that character <laughs> are stuff that um, a Muslim consultant might say that is inauthentic to, or that is probably not, whatever, whatever a, a Muslim consultant might say, um, but. Regardless, what they will do is find a Muslim consultant who will just say what they want them to say yeah. so that they can tell the story they want to say and say, oh, but we talked to somebody, boxes checked, right? So ultimately, the way to change that systemically is to get people in the room with the authority to tell those stories. Right, so that's why you need to support writers and people like Mike who are doing this work. <laughs> no, 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 for, no, because, because I'm accepting is, checks. <laughs> I mean, I just, I again, this whole process. I've been in this academic cocoon for uh, some years and doing various media things, but working within the entertainment industry and trying to solve some systemic issues has been eye-opening to me or to talk to people who are trying to do that work. And one of the things that was profound to me was that consultants do act as an erosion to this process. Yeah. And they end up checking the box and some just wanna be in the room so they will not challenge the representation so that they can continuously be hired by those producers or those showrunners. So you're taking the opportunity from them to hire a writer because they can say, I, I, you know, I have Mike as, as a consultant so I don't need to hire an Arab Muslim writer for Homeland or something like that. Um, and then that person wants to continue to come in so they're gonna say whatever you want them to say and say, yeah, the script looks good, just not so many guns, that's it, you know? And they'll do something cosmetic and it will be seen as just uh, placating everybody. And it is important, right? It, it, does, it does move the needle incrementally, right? But I think the way to really, really push the narrative or push the, push, uh, the needle to the other side is to have people in the room authentically telling those stories. Well, you know, and I, I, I think I just have to jump in and say, you know, being on the journalism side of this, and I, I've worked for Newsweek, Los Angeles Times, covering what you're talking about. Yeah. And, but also being in the room when decisions are made, being made about what stories to run. Mm. Right. And like, um, 
representation on that end, there was like nobody in there, especially when I was at Newsweek in the 2000s. And I remember specifically one meeting that we had right before the invasion of, Ra- of, of Baghdad in 2003, where, you know, and I'm half Iraqi, and, um, and I know my dad knew uh, Dr. Jallo, which is very exciting. Um, but, but I remember this conversation among the, you know, uh, foreign editors, the experts in the area, talking about Baghdad and talking about Iraq in terms of strate- strategic hits, military, what's that going to look like on the ground when they blow things up? Nobody was talking about the human beings on the ground. Mm. And then I, I did bring up, you know, there's people, I was, I was the kind of, I was not supposed to be in on that conversation, <laughs> but I remember bringing it up, saying, you know, there's human beings on the ground. And it was like, oh, oh. Right, of course, okay. And then I remember the editor asking me, so you think that they're probably going to you know, welcome the troops with open arms, right? And I'm thinking, do you know us? Yeah. <laughs> do you know, like, look at the history of the Iraqi people. Look at, like, no. So it was just kind of that level of not understanding because there hadn't been any representation. And it's still pretty low in journalism. And so when I write about projects the type of projects you're doing, or when I wrote a piece about when Trump came in, you know, and he was, when he was campaigning and doing all this anti-Muslim, anti-Arab stuff, I did a piece about, yeah, yeah, Trump's pretty bad, but look who laid the groundwork. It was Hollywood. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, I think it takes representation on that side also to see this stuff, to even write those stories. So if your kids want to be journalists, push. Wait, Lorraine, can I ask you a question? Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, how, what is it like for you to pitch to your editor in terms of what you think is relevant to what the pulse is uh, of the zeitgeist is versus w- <clears throat> what he or she might, you know, h- h- yeah. how does that how 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 does that work for you? It used to be really hard. Um, I used to have to really fight. I used to probably get three quarters of the ideas I wanted shut down. Um, and particularly, there was a lot of pushback from Islamophobic groups. They would get, you know, the publication would get letters and hate mail. And so I had to have editors that were super strong and push back against that. And I didn't always have that. So sometimes I would get shut down on this stuff. Now, though, I've gotten, I think because things have opened up a little more simply because we've been so involved in the Middle East, because there's been so much out there in terms of narratives about Arabs, that they've had to turn to me. Um, and so I am now a critic and a columnist, and I do commentary, so I can kind of pitch the things I want to do, oh, that's great. which is really different from what it was back in the day. But that was a long, hard fight, and many people drop out before they get there. Um, now I feel pretty lucky, but I also work my butt off to yeah. do it. Yeah, so. for sure. Right. Um, how much of an influence is is, is – politics influencing Hollywood more or is it the other way around? I mean, with this administration, I know you're not political, Mikey, but are we seeing, you know, <laughs> Hollywood being more of a Such a good, we're going to Detroit. <laughs> more of an influence than the other way around? Um, look, ho- Hollywood is a business, you know. Show business is a business, right? And, and right now, that's what sells. I mean, it's not right now. That's always what will sell. And I think telling you know, telling those kinds of stories or commenting on, you know, creating um, stories that mirror what's happening in real life versus a- and vice versa is 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 sexy. You know, it's it's, and I, I I think so. There will always be room for that, regardless of who's in office. Right. Yeah, no, but I think particularly now there is a need to answer. You know, we have our first TV president. We have our first yeah. reality TV president. Oh, wow. Um, you know, he knows how to work it. He knows how to work the media. He knows how to work the cameras. There, there's, I think there is way more response from film, but particularly from television, because television is where it's at right now. A lot of what you're talking about, of the opening up, is because television is such a wider and more interesting area than it sure. was. So they can respond a lot faster. So you can get... 
whatever it is. You can get the Night of, you can get Aziz Ansari, you can get the Tower, you can get all these things that are kind of responding. Even Murphy Brown, I don't know if you watched it since it's come back. So funny. Um, responding directly to like what Trump said three weeks ago, you know. So I definitely think it is kind of been a shot in the arm to Hollywood to kind of amp television to kind of like wake up and stop doing your same, you know, action movies because people are really, really interested in what's going on that's topical. So, um, you know, uh, Lorraine is also somebody who, as a young budding journalist, uh, her work inspired me phenomenally. I don't know if I ever oh, told you that, you. but um, you wrote an article about, I can't remember what incident happened, but it was the acceptability of anti-Arab racism mm -hmm. and how it's contrasted. Do you remember what that was about? It was like maybe 2007 or eight. It was, I even remember one of the lines, like if you put um, a Mexican in a sombrero and basically, or a black person in a minstrel show sort of imagery, there would be great backlash and resistance. But the Arab is still a figure that people can't recognize when explicit anti-Arab racism is happening. I mean, I, I, was it around the visitor? It could have been. It, it really, like, throw a dart. <laughs> and you will find but, a reason to write that story. But oh wait, no, actually, I think I remember it. It might have been the McCain um, because McCain was two thousand and eight. Oh. So oh, he's he's not oh, an Arab. He's, he's a good, good man. Yeah, good yeah, yeah. yeah. That so that's it, what happened. Yeah. And then we were reminded of this because people like Stephen King and then organizer named Michael Skolnick used this as an example to demonstrate that John McCain was somebody who was a moderate politician who had decorum yeah. about him because right. he could have a civil election. Um, campaign as contrasting yeah. Trump. But what that did demonstrate was that there still is this amount, um, immense amount of labor that we have to do to show that we are at minimum human, right? Yeah. And so another example of that when we were talking about TV and film responding to the moment is that in the same year, in 2018, Roseanne does an episode mm. where she, as a woman we know, um, Maha, um, talks about her demonstering herself, um, where she meets a Yemeni neighbor and goes through this process around the Muslim ban and trying to see them as not evil terrorists. The, the episode was ridiculous. Um, it was not good at all. But what did she, how did her show end? It was over a tweet and how she characterized a person who was part of the Obama administration in really racist, anti-black terms. But part of that tweet that nobody looked at was the Islamophobic part where she also called her some, uh, the, the child of an ape and somebody from the Muslim Brotherhood. Nobody touched the Muslim Brotherhood part. And that's because of the acceptability of anti-Arab racism that still continues. And this happened in 2018. And this is the same year that Sundance Film Festival, one of their key films was the movie Beirut. Which did you all see that? I only watch these films on the plane because I don't want to give them any of my money. <laughs> um, and it was just, it was so awful. It's, it was like, you know, Evelyn Asultani, who's also an amazing professor who's building on the work of Jack Shaheen, calls it the simplified complex, like this idea yeah. that they're telling moon, more nuanced stories because now there's a, a Fed that sees Israel as maybe a little evil, right? Um, and so this is where we're at in this moment. And I don't know, I, I try to wrap my brain around what it takes to really shift the discourse around seeing us as a little bit more human. I, can, I, so to that point, right, whose job is it to change the discourse? And, and the reason why I asked that rhetorical question, obviously, is because the answer is us. Um, <clears throat> what's that? Everyone. Every yes, <laughs> uh, like us meaning everyone. I am currently casting a film that I'm directing. And in the film, three of the lead roles are authentically Arab Muslim men. And we, I, we've been very fortunate enough to have a, a ton of Arab men come into the room to, uh, to uh, audition for these roles. And I, I kid you not, they come into the room, this is a romantic comedy by the way, it's like very light, intentionally so. 
There's zero uh, socio-political conversation happening in the film. It's very, it's like about hummus and other things um, that are not that important, except hummus is important. Um, <laughs> important. And um, and the the their approach in the room is so heavy it's so maudlin they they sit down and they say these lines and it's though they're they're begging to be released from prison or they're waving you know it's and and i'll say uh, you know like hey that's great but this is you know it's a romantic comedy can we lighten this up a little bit you know and, and what is so apparent to me is and i you used a word there's a word to describe what i'm talking about it's a arab fatalism sorry arab fate oh i don't know i just i don't know but it. you just said it it was um was it evelyn's <laughs> simplified complex no uh, uh, shoot, it's where you know they're acting like how they want the white man to perceive. Oh, the white, the white man's gaze. The white man's gaze, right? So everything they're doing is very heavy-handed, and it's it's like so important. And really, I just want you to talk. And and it's it's because every time they enter, every time an Arab enters an audition room, they're going in for a role that is sort of is heavy, is very sort of like terrorist number four or prisoner number eight, you know, and so that is that is their version of training. That's all they know. But when they're asked to just speak or to have an opinion about the weather or something, it's almost too difficult. I think I'm going to open it up to questions. Uh, that was quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that hand shot up real quick. Yes, so uh, please, again, uh, let's keep questions to... Questions, <laughs> um, not comments. Uh, um, yeah, let's let's ask questions, and then we, we want we do want to finish on time, so we'll take as many questions as we can, and then uh, get you rolling. No, no, I I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I'm going to try to pair this into a question. I agree with you all 100. percent I'm an attorney by day, but I do believe that with automation, robotics, everything that we're doing and especially with the mediums that we have in our hands, that storytellers are gonna be the most powerful people in the future. I've decided that as a lawyer, and as an Arab American growing up in Orange County, that I can't just be a lawyer, I need to be a storyteller. So, hate to do this self-promotion, I have written a movie, it ha I am working with a producer who is a um, Orange County um, local, he's gonna be elected to office pretty soon in a city here in Orange County, but we're having a hard time getting Arabs, quote unquote, on board. We're having a hard time getting funds. We're having a hard time getting a director. And I swear the movie doesn't suck because I wouldn't write something that sucks. It's won a couple of, <laughs> it's won a couple of screenwriting awards, but can you give any advice to somebody who has written a story about what it's like as an Arab American to grow up in white Orange County wanting to be white, but ultimately finding acceptance with what we have grown up with. Because I'm not having any success yet, and you people seem to be the professionals. You're talking about we need to tell these stories. Well, I've written a story, so you tell me. What do I gotta do? I, I mean, this is, but, but this is why I think, I've had these conversations. I've been thinking around film projects, um, TV series projects as well, and I work on screen and broadcast journalism, so, I'm in these conversations a little bit. There are people who are going the traditional studio route. There are people who are going the traditional production company route. Um, but there's a lot of invisible work behind that that folks don't see. That's one. Two, there are, as I mentioned, people who are successful self-funding or crowdfunding through your Kickstarter, through whatever crowdfunding app is really popular now, or a Patreon. Um, that are they, that put either a teaser out around the work, or develop a pilot, or do something, or do the whole project themselves. And so, it. I think the question is who you want to see the work, where where do you want it to live, and what's the message of the work. And I think that probably motivates what kind of fight you're you're going for in terms of producing it. So, I don't know. I I'm, Is the ADC becoming a production company? Uh, <laughs> if so, I'll, let I'll, me I'll, on. Let I'll, me I'll, I'll give you a bit of a, a background. 
Well, yeah, yeah. it's, yeah. it's uh, there are um, organizations and initiatives out there, and I think we're going to hear uh, about some in a, in a minute. But the as ADC, we've always been, and this was led by Dr. the late Dr. Jack Shaheen. We've always been on the end to respond uh, or try to get in there. Uh, you know, if a film has a negative stereotype, if there's a problem with the storytelling, we would we would respond. We do see a need uh, in trying to get out here and maybe work in that field. We're still trying to, f you know, get a feel of our way around it. We can't just jump into this uh, uh, area with no, pro you know, no professionalism, no expertise and say, oh, we're going to get involved in storytelling. I mean, the experts are up here to my left. And uh, if there is a way down the line we can get involved in that, we would. But right now our resources are... Um, you know, empowering them and responding, you know, behind the scenes whenever we can. I, I'm sorry. No, please. No, I was just going to say one thing really quick, and I don't know if I'm, if this is a bad thing to say, but, because we're here with ADC, but I know that MPAC did a, sorry, awesome. did a, Hollywood um, Bureau. <laughs> Hollywood Bureau. We work yeah, with the MPAC. Hollywood Bureau, they did a, um, okay, you know, so they do, they're doing round tables of, of writers, up and coming writers, okay, so that's one, but, you, these are great resources. Right? Like, yeah, what is your, it's I, also networking within yeah. this thing. I, I would also, I mean, okay. I'm, I'm yeah, happy okay. to have a conversation with you offline as well, um, but I, I would also ask you, what is your producer doing? Yeah, and offline. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay, so we're going to take two questions, <laughs> and then we'll shoot it back to the panelists to okay. answer both, okay? But there's one, and then behind you as well. Okay. Uh, this is Shafika. Uh, yes, the question is, there is a story I have it related to Arab uh, people and uh, how can we do it as a movie? Please. Okay. So, so maybe that's something you could talk off offline about? Uh, I don't know if I need this. I'm too loud. Just, no, we just oh, okay. recording F Oh, fine, fine. fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the one thing that I wanted to just, and I will phrase it as a question <laughs> wanted to talk about was I very I agree We're with everything you guys are saying now. and very much value and appreciate the storytelling side of the business but I think like when we tend to have these panels we we I feel like we touch on but we never really like dive into also Arabs thinking of this as a business and really like thinking about how do we how do we start to strategize putting more Arabs in positions that are like historically positions that are gatekeepers. So like, you know, ABC has a black president of the network now, which is such a monumental thing and probably inspires the content that you'll see from ABC. Because I think too, like if you think about after 9-11, how long did it take for politics and for like media to catch up and actually like how long did it take us to build an appetite for these types of stories? Right. So, you know, what would you guys say about looking forward 10 years from a business perspective? Like how can Arabs be more involved in elevating other Arabs to become studio heads, to become creative heads? You know, what because it's gonna take that to really elevate our filmmakers. You know, otherwise we're gonna have starving artists forever. Well, I think it's a little bit of what I touched on earlier, which was the the sort of cultural change within our own homes about what we're instilling in our kids that they can do. And if, you know, m most studio heads, most, um, most uh, heads of production companies start out in some other facet of the business itself and work their way up through you know, uh, experience and the people that they know to get into those positions, some as actors, some as producers, some as lawyers, some as accountants, you know, and, it, and sort of, so it's, it's a matter of just first and foremost believing that this is an industry that will accept you, it's believing that this is an inst industry that you can actually be a part of, and then just working your way through. And listen, er, there's, n there's no shortage of hard work ethic when it comes to the Arab American or Arab community. So like that will be the easy part, you know, thank God. But like after that, like getting in there and really sort of, you know, th looking at how a non-traditional um, track might be okay for you. Uh, hi, uh, this is a question for Meha and, and Mike. Uh, Me Mehtha. May. Uh, or I'm, May, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, we, were, we were talking about a mutual friend we have named Meha Shailuni. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, Mike. It's okay. I have, yeah, I have a very uh, um, Beautiful Khaliji name. name. Yeah. <laughs> Meha. Um, 
if you are like me for the past half a century, most of the movies and most of the TV production in this country, and some of them even in Europe when I used to be live in Europe, were always personalized uh, a great doctor, a great nurse, a great engineer, a great uh, uh, any, any technician or professional or any social worker as having some connection to a Jewish grandfather, grandmother or something. And, and there is always the Holocaust in, in a romantic movie, fine, but in a historic movie, fine. And I'm waiting for them to put the Holocaust in a musical where the Jews will be dancing going to the, to the jazz chamber. I mean, wh what are they waiting for? So, so my question is, what the hell is going on where we cannot, we as Arabs, create a conception of Arabs having a, a, a likable personality, historically and otherwise. And one of the things that the vice president of Disney, I spoke to yesterday, I said, she, uh, you should, she said, we're very happy to do Sinbad the Sailor. I said, instead of, of Sinbad the Sailor, try Zenobia who empowered queen, yeah. Zenobia as a, as a, as a, as a, as a woman, as a, as a, as a Syrian queen yeah. who was able to conquer even uh, Solomon, the, 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 uh, the king of Israel, which is supposed to be one of their greatest king. He was at her feet. So, so if we can create that feeling, why can't we, you in the movie industry and, and even in, 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 uh, in the media, um, I produced almost. Um, we, seven I'm sorry. I'm magazines. sorry to interrupt, but we have to. Uh, and, we got to give them an opportunity. Can to you respond. can you answer the question? How can we make the Arab personality more likable? That's how the Jews conquered America. I don't think the. I don't think the. I don't want to speak for you, but I think the question is not can we. It's who will tell that story. How will that story get out there? Because there are plenty of people writing likable Arab characters. Plenty. I, I deal with them. I'm sure you've read plenty of scripts. I know that Dina Nassar in the back, I know that definitely does Sarah Bazzi. Why isn't it on television and in the movies? Well, I mean, there are. There are. I mean, I, I think part of it is we, we, we're talking about, you know, how bad things are, and they are. But we have to celebrate it when something That's happens. Right. And, and things are happening. And to your question about... The, the, the industry itself, the way it works, if you look at African Americans now, a couple people get in, they pull someone up behind them, they pull another person up behind them, we're seeing it happen. And I do think that is going to happen for us too. I mean, you are an example oh, of this so happening. Well, so, but I gotta say, I mean, th those things are there. We have to also look at it when it does work, recognize that, celebrate it, and do more of it. I mean, exactly to Lorraine's point, um, Ava DuVernay, mm -hmm. who yeah. did Selma, has a production company called Array. She has a show on Oprah's network. Okay, I'm already only talking about black women right now, um, called Own. Uh, the show is called Queen Sugar. They've made a commitment to have uh, black female directors for every episode this season. And they've successfully done that, including a black Muslim woman who produced a film that was that won an award at uh, South by Southwest called Jin. Her name is uh, her name is Nijla Mutman. So that's an example of exactly what Lorraine is talking about: is getting people in those positions where we help each other out is fundamental. But what I would say to the characterization is. There, there was a very interesting specific history to how Jews created and produced Hollywood. And there is a storytelling tradition within the Jewish community. You know, something fascinating I found out pretty recently was that in order to read the Torah, you have to read it with somebody else. And you can't read it by yourself, and it's for you to argue about passages so that you arrive at a different kind of interpretation than just by yourself or listening to a leader, you know, bring it down to you. So what that tells me is that there's an interesting sort of way that they learned how to tell stories. And they did bring it here. Um, and I don't know the exact details of how it happened. But I would also say that, you know, this is why black Americans say the African Holocaust 
was not is not a is not a big movie production either, um, or multiple stories about the genocide of Native Americans is also not a part of our story. The, the representation of natives is point is one tenth of one percent on television. That's that contributes to this idea of the vanishing um, Indian the vanishing Native American in our US imagination that they're all dead and gone. So there's so many communities that are dealing with this issue and they're trying to figure out how to tackle it as well. And I don't think it's also about creating a likable character. I think we need to create real characters. Yeah. yeah. Um, because that's another form of, of stereotyping ourselves. And there, there were interesting films like Jack Shaheen talks about this film in the early 1990s called Party Girl where I can't remember who the main character was but she fell in love with this um, falafel street vendor in New York who's Lebanese and played by a Lebanese guy and that was a cute romantic comedy and again it was one of the few that was out there but the fact that there was something a little authentic about that was interesting and he was the lead ro he was the romantic lead as well. I, I really think also, this comes back to May's point earlier, if w we can tell you where these stories are, can you tell us where the money is? Yeah. yeah. Like, can you <laughs> show, show us the community that's supporting these films to change these narratives. We'll, we'll, we'll flood you with scripts that will give you what you need. What kind uh. of questions are we supposed to <laughs> I'll start with 10 bucks. We can start there. <laughs> Ten. Uh, uh, let's, we, we're going to have to wrap up, so I want to give... Um, a minute closing on um, you know just thoughts, comments on uh, this issue and, and where we're going uh, forward. So you guys have been con you know having a good conversation. Just close us out with just a minute wow. each. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, do I have to do that? <laughs> I have to start? <laughs> In closing, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know I would I I I actually do think we are headed in a positive direction in terms of, when we say media, in terms of journalism, in terms of Hollywood, but particularly in terms of television, um, I would say, you know, support, like you're saying, monetary support, but also recognize when you see things that are small victories, and there will be things coming up behind that because our numbers are growing. There's people like us out there, and, you know, we are speaking up more and more in their second and third generations. I, I think we're headed in a good direction. I, I, yeah, I agree completely. I agree there have been massive waves of movement for sure and and thank you to, to you, Abed, and the ADC yeah. for engaging in a conversation like this. It's timely, it's important. Being here, um, you know, flanked by two amazingly articulate women and, and talking about this in, an industry, in this industry that I love is exciting. And, and honestly, the more we rally, the easier it will be. Yeah. Um, like I said, I have a report out. Look it up, it's called Huck and Hollywood, H-A-Q-Q. And I go over these 100 years that we're trying to battle against. So there is a lot on our shoulders in terms of the Orientalist image making that has been driven by militarism, imperialism, racism within this country that does fundamentally influence Hollywood and Hollywood influences our policies and consenting to those wars and consenting to drone strikes and consenting to surveilling our community. So those things are intimately related and we been dealing with it for over a century but there is a new wave happening and there are filmmakers there are actors there are writers and we need to get behind them and yeah. support them and in addition to that the report does have multiple recommendations that I think everybody would it'd behoove them to know about this industry and how it works and not seeing it just on the outside in the same way we tell people to get involved in politics the electoral process is not the only thing that is going to be our landslide or our shift or our, as uh, Rama was, um, Ramla was talking about, narrative change work happens within the pop culture sphere and we need to get involved in it as much as we can. Um, as I said, Rami's show is coming out this fall and I don't know if this guy is likable, but it is gonna be a real character based on his life and we should, 
go out, support him, and check out the, the report and see other ways that we can all plug in. Thank you. I just want to close by uh, 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 urging you to support the work of the panelists up here um, and, and these efforts. I also want to take a minute to acknowledge we have with us uh, uh, Professor Khalid Beydoun uh, in the back. He's trying to hide. Uh, he's also written extensively on this issue with his book, American Islamophobia. Um, and I do get a commission for each one he sells. <laughs> uh, but Lorraine, uh, Mike, uh, Dr. May, you guys have done uh, tremendous work. This is an important issue. Uh, again, we encourage you to check out uh, Dr. May's report, uh, support Mike's company, follow Lorraine and her work, um, and you know, hopefully the next few years we'll be having far more uh, positive uh, uh, conversations and in a, in a, the outlook is good and hopefully it keeps moving uh, forward. Thanks so I wanna thank you all. This concludes the panel uh, section of the convention. You guys could break now.